went out every day and did whatever we had to do to win. You know, great pitching staff. I mean, the defense was good. We didn't have the best hitters in the league, even though we had Reggie and Rudy and, you know, Campy. Really good players, but guys that could play and guys that were winners. That was that was the bottom line, I think. How much was Sal Bando as your captain part of that? Oh, he was he was he was right there. I mean, he was the captain, and you know, Dick would go to him all the time about things, and he'd be vocal. You know, he'd get on guys and say things, but didn't I don't. You know, you'd have to ask Sal, I guess, so maybe some of the the inner meetings that he's had with guys or what. But like I said, most of the guys took care of themselves. You know, there were, I mean, we had fights in the, in the dugout, we had fights in Detroit, fights on the plane. You know, different guys would get at each other, no different than what happens now. It just gets different, it, it's looked at differently, you know, reported differently. You know, Reggie, when Reggie started, I mean, he knew how good he was. You know, he battled Finley for every dollar he could get. You know, he'd hold out, come into camp, and didn't like what he was getting, but, you know, I mean, he certainly, certainly proved his worth. There's no doubt in the big games. You know, we came back from New York, the second World Series, and we were down. That's when we had the Mike Andrews incident. And the focus on the games back there was just Mike Andrews. I mean, and the Mets were good. They had some great pitching. So we come home down three to two, and I swear I can remember riding to the ballpark with, I think we used to go with Cat and Holtzman. We'd ride together to the ballpark. And in my own mind, I, 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 we're gonna win. You know, Reggie gets a big home run, I think, at that, at that time, and other guys do their thing, and we wound up winning. But Reggie was, I like Reggie. He, he's, you know, he's got a different personality with different people that he meets. I think Reggie's very bright. I mean, I've had conversations with him, you know, sitting on a plane with him or whatever, talking to him. He's very bright. You know, he's smart. Uh, you know, when he gets in the limelight, he's his own guy and he does his own thing. But God, what a career. I mean, him and Cat and Raleigh, you know, in the Hall of Fame, I mean, that's pretty neat. Kenfish Hunter seemed like, uh, at least his public persona was one, just a guy who did prefer to pitch, pitch, and then go fishing. Well, he was a North Carolina farm boy. You know, he had all that acreage back there and he had a bunch of dogs. And that's really what he wanted to do. He just wanted to get back home and farm. You know, he had bought the property from Finley and they had some contractual issues or whatever. And he wound up becoming a free agent because of it. Uh, but he just wanted to go home and do that. I mean, he was, you know, the way I've, I've talked about him or whatever, and I've written a book. I'm trying to get it published now, okay? Really? But part of, one big chapter is on Cat mm -hmm. because of how important he was to me on that club and, and how I related his death to my father's. But he was that big, strong guy who never seemed to waver. It didn't matter whether he was starting, whether he came in relief in the, in the Cincinnati series or what. He was the same guy on the mound all the time. I only saw him get flustered one time. And luck, and it, Reggie got involved in it. Somebody hit a fly ball to right field, and Reggie circled it like he sometimes would do. And of course, the ball dropped, you know. And I think we were ahead at the time, and I was playing, and I saw Cat. First time I saw him ever get flustered on the mound. And I went into him, and I said, "Hey, you know, calm down." I said, "You know what? Know what he's like out there. Okay, get your shutout. Let's go get the win." And he just went about his business. But he was stoic on the mound. You know, he'd give up home runs get right back up there and come right at him again. So affected by his death when I heard about it. I mean, it was just, I kind of equated that with my father's passing away. What made Raleigh figure so distinct? Probably Raleigh's personality. Um, you know, I, this is the story that he was a starter, but he was so nervous he couldn't handle that. So they threw him in the pen and just, hey, Raleigh, get up, you're in. But he has such a carefree attitude, had such a great slider such a big guy through strikes and just he he just fit for that role that just he's just like that now he's the same guy now yeah. you know you can kid with him you know at the reunions we have i mean guys just gravitate to him you know they love him him and Holtzman used to be at each other's throats all the time really? <laughs> i mean it was it was comical they were they were funny together <laughs> joe rudy joe's a quiet guy in the outfield who just did his thing like everybody did on that club you know didn't like to talk, didn't like the fanfare, you know, just went about his business. Made himself into a good outfielder. Apparently DiMaggio helped him out there. Um, funky stance at the plate, different, real different stance. Uh, but worked hard, you know, intense. Just like everybody else on that club did whatever they had to do to win. You, you played being a uh, second baseman. You did a lot of uh, um, 
Dick Green was, was, was Greeny, yeah. Did you guys just sort of alternate? How did Williams use you guys? Well, Greeny would usually start the games. I usually wound up finishing the games, if I remember correctly. And, and you know, in the, in the certain years, we had Cullen there and Maxville, and then Andrews was there. So whenever Greeny's turn came up, he'd, somebody would hit for him, and somebody would go in, somebody hit for the next guy, and I'd wind up going in and whatever. And as it turned out, you know, in that Met game, when, when Mike made the errors or whatever, I had been in, and he came in for me. Um, you know, unfortunately, he had the, the couple of errors that he made there, but that was a rotation that was just the way they did things. Campaneros. Campy was a little spark plug. Campy was a little Cuban catcher. In the minor leagues, they didn't know where to play him. Uh, the one year that I had put in my military duty, uh, I was slated, I think, at that time to go to double-A to be the shortstop. Well, they didn't, didn't have anybody else, so Finley decided, well, let's make Campy a shortstop. So they sent him there, and he wound up doing a great job. They wound up taking him to the big leagues, and he wound up staying there. Campy made himself into a really good player, but he was the spark plug of the club, you know, leading off all the time. He made himself into a good defender. Um, the one thing that I remember about Campy in the playoffs in the series, you could see him elevate his play. You know, you can tell that in certain guys when they get in big situations and tough spots that they just get better, and that's what Campy was. That's what I remember most about Campy and how he just, you know, I mean, he just played hard every single second. And the other thing about Reggie, what, whatever he, about Reggie, Reggie ran every ball out. I don't think I ever saw Reggie loaf, which was, you know, really an asset. What about Holzman? Kenny Holtzman, when he came over, I think it's helped solidify our staff, of course. Uh, funny thing about Kenny is we'd have these pitcher-catcher meetings and figuring out how to defend players, and we'd sit in there, and, you know, Dick would be in there, and he would do this with Raleigh. Raleigh would do the same thing, and Kenny would say, look, I'm throwing a fastball away. Play him that way. The meeting's over, and we'd walk out. That's, what, that's how he pitched. Yeah. Every pitch was a fastball away, maybe change up a few breaking balls every night, not much, but he threw strikes. Kept hitters off balance, and he was incredible. Didn't like, didn't like the fanfare at all. He still doesn't. I mean, let me pitch and let me get out of here. And that's what I got from him. I used to, my locker was next to him, and he just, you know, he didn't want anything to do with the writers. Vita, what about Vita Blue? Vita was, you know, I had gotten there after he had his great year. Right. Uh, but he was kind of a free spirit, kind of a fun guy, you know, just... Confident in what he was doing, just a good pitcher. I mean, he didn't have a great breaking ball, but again, those guys that threw strikes and left-handers to me always have a, a leg up on hitters anyway. And if you can throw strikes and you've got a little steam on the ball and the ball's going to sink or do something, and you throw a little wrinkle in there, I mean that was it. Mm -hmm. You know that was it. I mean he had the high leg kick, of course that probably messed the hitters up. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. All those guys, I mean, no matter who you ask me about, I'm going to say the same thing about every single one of them. They're just winners. Yeah. They just knew how to win. And they gave it everything they had every single day. That was the, that was the, the huge thing that I noticed. You know, I'm watching games a lot, sitting on the bench, you know, and then getting in there. I mean, they just, they played their hearts out. What was Gibson like? Probably the most intense player that you've read about that I've ever been with. He was incredible. I mean, he'd dictate the lineup he wanted to Shane Deese. He'd say who he wanted playing that day, but he was incredible. He was incredible. A single game, you had seven, seven RBIs. Right. The poor kid that gave up that home run was never seen from again. Is that right? I had hit a home run off of him in Milwaukee, and we go into Boston, and bases were loaded, and I hit one into the bullpen. Got a couple other hits or whatever, and you know, I mean, I don't know if that's why he was never seen again, but you know, it's just odd that I hit a grand slam off of him. The day was done that you're in the shower and say, "Holy crap! What happened to this uh, light hitting, great fielding Ted Kubiak?" Well, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to think I could hit somewhat. You know, when I played a little bit, and really, the one year that I played in Milwaukee, I hit 252. I missed, I think, two games. That proved to me that at least I belonged in the big leagues. Right. You know, I was an average player, you know, probably maybe a little better defensive player than, than a lot of guys. But it proved to me that at least I belonged up there. I've taken a lot of your time, but this has been a hoot. Yeah, good. Thanks a lot. Appreciate I'm it. I'm reliving my own kid <laughs> memories. <laughs>